Welcome everybody to the River Falls Public Library this evening. My name is Tanya Misselt. I'm the director of the River Falls Public Library. Thank you for coming to the program tonight, Frederick James Courier and Alaskan Adventure. The format is both in person, it's also live on Facebook and with a short delay on YouTube. It's also being recorded for later viewing. So with that in mind, I just want to let everybody know, remind you to silence your, your cell phones here in the audience. The virtual audience is welcome to post questions during the show, but we probably will not ask them until we get to the end to the Q&A. The live audience, um, you need to speak loudly when you ask a question. As Kim had told you, the, the microphone is here in the center for a very specific reason, kind of a little bit of a surprise. So we're trying to grab the, the volume in the entire room, the, the sound in the entire room tonight. Um, but still, if you ask a question, make sure you project your voice. So tonight I want to introduce you to Randy Zarnke. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I should have asked that first. He grew up in Wausau. He received an undergraduate degree from, the, from UW La Crosse and both a master's and PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He moved to Alaska in 1978 and worked for the Department of Fish and Game for 24 years. He's an avid hunter, fisher, and trapper, and he has a strong interest in Alaska history. Please welcome Randy. The last thing that was on the list that I sent her that she didn't mention was, I'm an avid Green Bay Packer. <laughs> I also should say, uh, when I normally do these presentations, I try to wear a coat and tie, but it is summer and it is uh, my vacation. So I hope you'll, Tanya said she expected a tuxedo, but <laughs> I hope you'll, uh, you'll let me slide. So I have the very distinct pleasure of sharing with you tonight some information regarding uh, the adventures of a man who I've come to respect and admire over the last several years. His name is Frederick James Courier. He was born here and lived here in River Falls back in the 1890s. He had a comfortable life here in town, um, but wanted to do better for his family. And through an odd set of circumstances, he ended up in Alaska back in 1894, intent on striking it rich in the gold fields. And if you think of the timing of things, this was before the big Klondike gold rush. You know, it was four or five years earlier than, than that. He was a, a, a tough, uh, intelligent, personable man. And I've come to assume a, a natural born leader. So I could spend uh, the next 45 minutes up here telling you about uh, Fred and his life and his adventures in Alaska, but I'd really like to take a little different approach. We're fortunate tonight to have the spirit of Fred Courier with us. So spirit, can you join us? Howdy, folks. So, Fred, tell us a little bit about your life before you came to Alaska. Well, so we were living in River Falls at the time, and uh, we were surviving, but uh, I wanted more for, for my family. So uh, I hatched a plan to go out to Oregon and buy an apple orchard out there. And so on, on the way out on the train ride, I ran into a couple of fellows that actually convinced me to... Uh, go with them up to Alaska to mine for gold. So next thing I know, there I am uh, in Juneau, purchasing an outfit and uh, we were headed up over the Chilkoot Pass. So the Chilkoot Pass has a very famous reputation of being a very tough place. So as you went over, did you have a specific location in mind where you were going to, to go? Yeah, we were, we were headed to 40 mile country, uh, which is, uh, so we, we rafted in on the Yukon. Now, let me tell you, that, that was a difficult trip. The river was all iced up and we had a hard time getting there. Uh, and once we arrived, uh, the mining season was already halfway done. So we were lucky enough to find jobs at a local trading post where we were able to spend the rest of the summer there 
uh, working at the trading post and picking up tips from some of the local fellows who are out there. And uh, we started hearing rumors of a, a, a big strike at a nearby creek called Mastodon. So we purchased the claim out there and headed down a circle for the winter. So where was your first mining claim actually located? Well, it was in, uh, uh, as I said, on Mastodon Creek, which is in the Circle Mining District, about 70 miles from Circle. Um, the claim that we had purchased, uh, we had purchased it sight on scene, which is uh, pretty much exactly what you'd think. <laughs> we, we had never seen the site before we purchased it. So when we arrived, um, the site we purchased was, was number 39 above Discovery. And once we arrived, we realized that it was two miles above the tree line. Uh, for us, that meant uh, we'd have to walk two miles downhill and carry our wood two miles uphill uh, for everything. And, you know, we, we use wood to build our cabins and build our tools and sluice boxes and to, to heat the place. And uh, so it was a constant chore hauling wood down down to the tree line back up to our encampment. Um, first run of water showed up on May 1st. And shortly after that, we built a crude dam that we could use to, to block up the water and use it for sluicing out the gravel. Um, you know, uh, how about your first cleanup? The first cleanup, the first cleanup that we had out there, we produced 44 ounces of gold. Which is no small task for right. even in today's standards. So were there any special events for you that summer? Well, well, I remember one time I was up on a high ridge and it was nearing, uh, it was in the evening. So I decided to stay up there, watch the, watch the sun come down and not quite set uh, that night. Uh, another time there was a, a, a group of, there was a strike nearby and every miner from every place around us was all streaming towards that location. So we got up and, and ran out there and it was a 20 mile hike uh, only to get there and find that nothing had actually happened. Uh, we'd all just gone out there for nothing, but that's just how miners think. When something's going down, you get up and go. So it was all just a rumor. That's right. Uh -huh. So then you left Alaska for a year. That's right. We came, I came back home here uh, to have a boat built, uh, and that would allow us uh, uh, back up in Alaska to, to uh, explore more channels uh, on, our, on our own discretion without having to depend on other people to give us rides on the air boats. And uh, so you eventually ended up, when you went back up then, you ended up on the Chena River. Tell us about that trip and what, what prompted you to go there? Well, so we had heard a lot of good things about the, uh, the Chena, so we thought that would be worth our time. And the trip up river? Well, so we took our boat, which was called the Potlatch, uh, we traveled that river and we were, um, you know, panning at the various, uh, sandbars and, and just exploring around. We found enough gold to pique our interest. So once we got far enough in, we stashed the boat and half of our crew went inland and started to build a cabin and the other half would haul the tools. Uh, and once we had our location established, we'd push on to another location and we kind of work our way into the land that way. Now, eventually we got to a place at DeMar Creek where we had three or four cabins built there and we called that Fort Independence. And we, we ended up spending the next two years mining for gold at that location. So tell us about your, your life and the, the mining activities there uh, on the Upper Chena. Well, we had a good group, you know, every, everybody got along. Uh, we, did, we didn't have any of those petty squabbles that we heard about in the other groups, you know, it was always fighting going on when the, you know, when everybody's got those pieces of gold. <laughs> so, uh, but there was always plenty to do, you know, uh, hauling and chopping wood, uh, you know, the, just a daily chore hauling that wood up. I can't, I can't express how much time we spent uh, hauling wood and chopping lumber because uh, we use it for everything, uh, including heating the homes, which uh, the coldest temperature I recall out there was 70 degrees below zero. Now that is cold, let me tell you, when you're chopping your own wood, especially. Um, so they, uh, 
we had plenty of food stores, you know, so we, we ate well. There was always fresh meat, you know, care, plenty of abundant caribou in the area, always. Uh, when we did have spare time, we would uh, go out and, and uh, explore the surrounding areas, trying to find uh, that next location for the big strike, uh, you know, looking for gold. So after you had been in, at Fort Independence, which is what you named your camp up there, after a year, you had some visitors. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Some fellas came up on a boat called the Jenny M. And, uh, you know, they, they came out there just because they heard we were good miners. And um, they wanted to see if there was enough to go around. Now, by, by the time they got to our location, uh, it was late enough in the season that they weren't able to leave. Or if they did, they would have got frozen in the river. So uh, we decided the best thing was for them to stay the winter with us. And so we sent out a combined hunting party to up our stores. And we brought back 30 caribou, two bears, two moose. <laughs> On that trip, I actually fell in the river myself and almost died. So I almost froze to death on the side of the river. Lucky some of my quick thinking companions hauled me out of there and started a fire on the side of the river. And, Taught me pack out. And uh, then you had another visitor kind of midwinter. That's right. Uh, Windy Jim. Uh, that was in the year 1900, and Windy Jim was with the census. So we figured uh, Jim had traveled 450 miles just to count the 16 of us. <laughs> now that is dedication. Well, federal employees, right? So how did it come about? How did you decide to leave Fort Independence? Well, there was a big, uh, a big strike up at Nome. And so um, we, done, we made our mind up to head on down there. And so we hitched a ride with the fellas on the Jenny M and they brought us down as far as, as our boat, the potlatch. But um, we, we discovered that that our boat had been uh, dammed up by beavers and we spent days trying to trying to uh, trying to free it up, but we just weren't able to do it. And we had to abandon it there. And how did uh, uh, excuse me, but how much gold did you find at Fort Independence? Now, there are some questions that you do not ask in polite company. <laughs> You don't ask a woman her age, and you don't ask a gold miner how much gold he found. Understood. Next question. So what was your experience in Nome? What did you find there? Oh, by the time we got to Nome, all the good claims were taken. So uh, I, I just had to go and find a job with an old friend of mine as a mine boss. And eventually, I just made my way down to California, and I purchased an almond farm. Much easier than mining for gold. <laughs> Well, thank you. We're going to move on to the next session, but please, a round of applause for Nathan. <laughs> so, I, allow me to, to emphasize that this was not made up. These were all facts, so everything you heard here was real. And you might ask, how did we know all this about Courier? There's a couple of ways, and one of which is that two members of his party were very dedicated photographers. And this was at a time when, you know, they didn't take pictures with these. There's a display in the back there of a giant uh, box camera, and I don't think they took anything that big. But you remember the old collapsible ones, and you took pictures on glass slides and that sort of thing. So just think of the dedication it took to keep that stuff safe and, uh, you know, not getting wet and broken and that sort of thing. And um, they, they left us with a lot of good photos. And remember, we're not talking 15 years ago. We're talking 125 years ago. And a lot of these photographs remain. So I'm going to share some of them with you tonight. This is are the blueprints for the potlatch. This is the boat that Courier came back about halfway through his 10 year, 10 year tenure in Alaska. And he had this built, uh, boat built here. 
in the States. I believe it was in Chicago. It was shipped out to Seattle on, by train, then put on a bigger boat and hauled to the mouth of the Yukon River. Um, you know, I hate, I, I hate, hate to repeat myself, but the fact that simply this image exists from 125 years ago, it's phenomenal to me. Um, these are just a couple of boats that the crew had. You notice the larger one was handmade. You know, they cut trees, they whipsawed that lumber and built that scow. Uh, the one in the front, we have less, you know, idea there. That was probably brought up from the States. I can't imagine they were able to build something like that on site. Um, there was another man that I should mention early on here. His name is Ed Conrad. He was a member of the Courier Party and Courier lived and grew up here in River Falls and Ed Conrad was from nearby Hammond. And Ed Conrad was one of the men that took a bunch of these photographs that we'll be looking at tonight. Um, I don't believe that this photo was taken on the Chino where they did most of their mining. This was probably on the Yukon River. These are mostly king salmon, you know, probably going up to, uh, you know, 35 pounds or so. Very good eating. And um, for a bunch of men that, you know, didn't, weren't able to bring all their food with them, you know, they brought enough. But the, being able to harvest the fish and game there in the state was, I'm sure, a huge addition to their diet. Um, just uh, a, a camp scene, you know, um, um, the spirit of Fred told us about rafting down the Yukon and at one point they dumped their raft and they lost half of their gear. And I jokingly tell people if that was me, I would have been curled up under a spruce tree crying for my mommy. And these guys just shrugged it off and it was more a matter of, hey, we still got half our stuff. Let's keep going. And you can see, I mean, these are pretty hard bitten men that, you know, they're able to live with a hardship here and there. The dogs were uh, uh, in, uh, present in many of the photographs, as you will see. They were just favored companions of the whole crew. Um, head nets in, in Alaska in June and July are almost a necessity. Uh, one thing that I have seen this picture probably 15 times since we first uh, brought this book out. And um, it was just within the past month or so that I noticed a detail that I had never picked up before. Can anybody, let's see if I get this right. Can anybody read the letters on that tail? L-A-T-C. So if you add a P-O on the front, this was a pail off the boat, the potlatch. So how many of those little details just kind of confirm that this is the real deal and we're putting it all together? Here's another photo that I've seen probably 10 times and um, uh, didn't really pay too much attention to it until once again, about a month or six weeks ago, I looked at it and saw this string and I looked over here and saw a bunch of boots and shoes waiting to be repaired. So in a group of men out in the middle of nowhere for two years, everybody had to have a skill. Everybody had to contribute to the, the success and the welfare of the group. So obviously, somebody, maybe Conrad, maybe Courier pointed at this man and said, you're our cobbler. And so... Uh, I, I love finding little details like this in, in the photographs. Um, this is a good example of the land where they, um, they eventually mined on the upper Chena River for a couple of years. Um, above tree line, as you can see, one thing you probably wouldn't pick out, but this man down here is butchering a caribou. And as we mentioned during the presentation with the spirit of Fred, that that was a major source of meat for them. Um, this is one of the cabins that, as, as, as the spirit of Fred said, what they would do when they were going up to China, they'd split the group in half, and the four of us would go up 10 miles and build this cabin. The rest of the other people in the, in the crew would start hauling supplies. So they'd ferry them up little by little. 
about the time that they got the first load of supplies there, these guys would be done with the cabin. So they'd hike another 10 miles up and build another cabin. And they just leapfrog that way and work their way up the river. Uh, you can see, whoops, gotta go back. Uh, this is Fred right here, as you can see in the, in the, the with a little notation. Um, at one point, we thought that this cabin was the infamous Fort Independence, the ultimate place where they mined from. We later learned better. Uh, you also see the dog there in the front. That dog's name was Bella, and it was uh, was a Courier's favorite. Here's a, a picture of Fred and Bella. Dogs were not just pets; they were they were working animals too. Uh, this picture might look like a. Uh, it's a, it was labeled in the Juno uh, Public Library uh, photo collection as a bear. <laughs> But uh, if you look at those ears, uh, it's not a bear, it's a moose. And it might look to some of you like a trophy shot, you know, of a man posing with the moose that he shot. But think of it, when this hide is tan, that becomes belts and suspenders and boots and backpack straps and all of that. This wasn't a prize, uh, a trophy to hang on the wall. This was raw materials for them. Here's the Jenny M, which is the other boat that came up after they came up on the potlatch. And um, in the winter, they would oftentimes just pull them into a side slough and let them freeze in. Uh, they were too big to try to get out of the water, so you just had to allow them to freeze in. You take it into a side slough so that if you left it out in the main channel, when breakup would occur, the big chunks would either damage it or take it away without you. And uh, I think this next slide, so it's, it, this is a similar slide to the first one. And a friend of mine who has really gotten enthused in this whole story of Courier on the China, when I showed him this, we both had kind of the hair on the back of your neck stand up. He says, I live about three quarters of a mile from there. I can see that spot from my front window. It's just one of these other little tidbits that adds to the overall story. So here's another way to move a bunch of freight. You know, they, uh, they had a couple of dogs, but not enough to pull all of their freight. So the men ended up loading those sleds and pushing and pulling and, you know, getting them up upstream to where they would eventually reach their, the place that they wanted to mine. And I think this next slide shows something similar. And the only reason I pointed out to you is because there's an addition here that wasn't on in the first picture. You notice this little device here. And anybody want to guess what that might be? It's an odometer. And so they were able to push their stuff upstream and measure distances that way, which further confirms to me that either Courier was just an absolute brilliant man who knew all of the things they were going to need or he chose, chose his crew so well that everybody contributed in one way or another. You know, I can envision me going up on a trip like this and saying, you know, it'd be neat if we really had a way to measure distances. But they thought of that before they went up. And here's the result of it. They were able to draw maps that are remarkably accurate. I mean, you can overlay these on current maps and they don't mesh exactly, but they're pretty darn close. And uh, this is, whoops, I keep doing that. Uh, this river that runs from kind of upper left to lower right is the river we call the Tanana. Um, it's a major tributary of the Yukon River. And the area that we're most concerned about here in the middle is where Courier and his crew mine. The two different locations are, are relatively close to each other. And there's a, 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 a blow up of that crosshash area. And I certainly don't expect you to um, be able to read all of this. Yeah, I got to get back in my box, don't I? Um, but um, on there, uh, right in here is a labeling of Fort Independence 
and further down here is Fort China. And if we go to today's map, um, you can find Harrison Fort, you can find Plums Fort, you can find half or more of these rivers on today's maps. And so once again, I mean, where did all these names start? They prob Some of them probably started with Courier and his party. Uh, during uh, the uh, uh, presentation by the spirit of Fred, we talked about the census form or the taken in 1900. And he, this was one of the others that caused the hair in the back of my neck to stand up, to think that we were actually able to find the original census form from 1900. And um, if you look real closely, the first name there is Ed Conrad from Hammond, Wisconsin. The next one is Fred Courier from River Falls, Wisconsin. There are a couple others down here from Taylor Fall, Minnesota. And, um, you know, just think of having to mush dogs uh, several hundred miles to count the, there's another page to this, but to count these 16 guys. Um, those are the sorts of things for any of you that are amateur historians. When you find something like this, it's just like God shined on you and allowed you to find something really special. Um, for those of you that don't understand what's going here, this is called a saw pit. In order to make lumber, you build this framework out of logs, and then you put a big log up on top, and with a two-man saw, you saw lo uh, a big log into dimensional lumber. And every description I've ever read is that this is backbreaking work for both people, but especially for the man on the bottom. In addition to working very hard, he gets a face full of dust every time, sawdust every time he pulls it down. And uh, the other thing I, I notice on this is how well the saw, saw uh, pit is built. It wasn't just slapped together, you know, it was really well done, which tells me once again that either they were all good carpenters or he had the foresight to take one really good carpenter along who was the foreman when it came time to build these things. And this is a, a courier on the top and Ed Conrad on the bottom. This is the men actually at work in the creek. And um, in the, one of the descriptions we read, they talked about having a 300 foot long sluice box. And, you know, I don't expect you folks to understand the ins and outs of mining, but you don't need a long sluice box to catch gold. And when I made a presentation similar to this up in Fairbanks, a woman came up to me afterwards and she said, I'll tell you exactly what that's about. When you're on the downstream end of a sluice box, the gravel comes out and piles up at your feet. So there's two ways to deal with that. You either shovel it out or you extend, you ignore it, and you extend the, the sluice box another 10 feet. And so her, her explanation of why they bragged about having a 300 foot long sluice box is that they just kept extending it every time the tailings built up too high to, to work any further. And you'll notice again, if you look closely, the head nets. This photo I first found in the Juneau Historical Society in, in Alaska, and it was labeled Men Digging Trench, which I just laughed out loud when I first read that, because if you know anything about mining, the where you're going to find the gold is not laying on top of the ground. It's right down at bedrock. And so what these guys were doing is probably out here, they had found somewhere in, um, in the river gravels, they had found gold, and they determined that it may have come in on the, a, a side street. And so they were digging down to bedrock uh, with the hopes and the belief that they were going to hit the big load. And so it wasn't men digging trench, it was men digging down to bedrock to find gold. And if you look closely, this isn't soft dirt here. It's probably half dirt and half rock. And for those of you that have wielded a, a shovel in that kind of ground, it's, there's nothing fun about it. So just hard work, hard work is what mining in that day was all about. Here is the infamous Ford Independence that we've heard uh, referred to several times. 
And um, you remember the uh, flat roof cabins that I showed you earlier. These are the first peaked roof cabins that we've seen in photographs. And so it tells us that when they're moving and the cabins are temporary, you just throw something up and move on. But when you think you're going to spend time there, you do it right. Um, I can also tell you now, or I could tell you later, but I'll do it now. Um, here's another one that when it first happened, the uh, hair on the back and the neck stands up. There's a, a young uh, PhD student, a uh, history student in, at the University of Alaska that, um, you know, the guys like me don't know how to use things like Google Earth, but this young fella does. And we told him where we thought this was, and he went to Google Earth, and he found this exact uh, uh, series of hills. And it wasn't the sort of thing where when you looked at his image and our image, you say, yeah, that, that, that could be it. You look at it and you just, it's, there's no question about it. And so we now feel that we know within 50 yards of where Fort Independence was. And we've been planning to go for the last couple of years and take metal detectors. And I mean, we're not going to find those cabins by any stretch. They're 125 years and they've blown away to nothing. But if we can find nails or hinges or a teapot or whatever it was, we'll feel like we've confirmed our, our belief. Here's a, a close up of one of the cabins. And again, I'll repeat myself. They either had one really good carpenter who was the foreman or they were all good because that is really a good cabin. Here's those three that were on the, on the ridge. And we don't really know, um, you know, whether they lived in these, they might have stored things. Uh, but anyway, they're, they're part of the compound that's known as Fort Independence. Uh, these are recent pictures. Um, Ed Conrad's great grandson told me that he had a few photographs and then later confirmed that it was like 110. And this was one of them. And I love it for a, a couple of reasons. You know, it just shows the men on their, their few, their little bit of downtime kind of relaxing, but it also shows over here that somebody had uh, the foresight that, you know, he took it a little bit further and built a rocking chair. Here's another one just showing men in a tent. And I like the, uh, the U.S. flag in the background and then the picture of somebody's baby daughter, I'm sure, that got, got up there somehow. And, uh, you know, just the, the, the little bit of downtime that those guys had, you got to remember they were human beings, too. Here's another way to produce gold um, in Alaska. Uh, it isn't all done in the, in the summer. The vast majority of it is. But in the winter, you can go uh, like a feast guys found gold in this general area they would then go back and dig a shaft from ground level down to bedrock in hopes of finding that, you know, where a big collection of gold had settled in the creek. And with the ground being frozen, they could go straight down without much fear of the sidewalls collapsing. And then they would, uh, let's see, this would be a windlass here that they could then crank buckets of that gravel up and dump it off to the side. And then in the summer, they would have this big pile of what's commonly just referred to as pay dirt that they could then sluice in the summer. So it's, it's a hard way to mine, but if you're sitting around the cabin for weeks on end doing nothing, it's better than sitting in the cabin again. And uh, if you can produce even a little bit of gold, that's more than you had if you hadn't done it this way. This, uh, the, the, a little, I'll talk a little bit about how, how do we know all this stuff? And I showed you a bunch of pictures, but in addition to the pictures, Fred Courier took this really great story of his adventures with his crew. And he was an excellent, excellent writer. And he produced a wonderful book, which I was going to have copies here tonight for you folks. And unfortunately, there was a miscommunication up in Fairbanks and the books were never sent. But what happened is Fred moved to uh, California, as the spirit of Fred told us earlier. And, um, you know, he did a bunch of presentations in his hometown to the 
you know, the Chamber of Commerce and the church group and all of that. And people, I'm sure, said, hey, Fred, you got to write a book. And so in 1934, he wrote this book entitled An Alaskan Adventure. And unfortunately, he died like six months later before anything could be done with it. And he may not have told anybody in his family about it because it was forgotten until the mid 1980s when his daughter was pawing through his desk one day and found this manuscript. And I can only assume she had the same reaction I did when I first read it. And it was it's so good that she did what she could to get it published at the time. And it didn't happen, but we found it again uh, about 12 years ago and, and got it published. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. In any event, this is one of the handwritten, original handwritten pages from the ma that manuscript. And I see a lady in back shaking her head, and you have the same thought I do. Isn't it amazing that things like this still exist and, and we, we've got the, we can put them together? The other thing that Fred did is he wrote other documents and when his grandson handed me three or four of these i thought they were brand new stories and i got super excited but when i went back and compared them to the book uh three of the four what i thought were standalone stories he kind of morphed and rewrote and worked in the chapters in the book uh, but the reason i wanted to share this with you is isn't that just wonderful handwriting i mean it you don't really get to the point of calligraphy, but I mean, I don't know, I could never write like that for, and, and for him, it was apparently quite natural to do so. This is Fred after he moved to uh, California and his second wife. Um, here's another one of those, you know, very elaborate uh, handwriting uh, articles. And this one, once again, was, was kind of revised and worked into the book. This one as well. This is the only one. Tim Chu the Wolf Slayer is a story about a little Indian boy and the lifestyle of the Indians up there in interior Alaska back around 1900. And we're not sure exactly what we're going to do with this yet. I'd like to release it in some format, but we just haven't quite figured out what we're going to do with it yet. Um, some of these pictures are repeats, so I'll, I'll go through them. Um, the first photo we have of, of the cabins, the main cabins at Fort Independence, you might remember that there was one cabin. But then that second year, that other boat came up and got uh, uh, stranded there, and so they had to stay. And I think the second cabin shown here was built because of that, for the second uh, boatload of guys. Here are uh, two letters that were written by Ed Conrad to his wife, who was living in Hammond, and they were printed in, somebody help me here, what would have been the newspaper in Hammond? Well, not that any of you were around at the time. Pardon me? The Hammond News, okay. And um, when the Spirit and I were going through these earlier today, uh, he picked out one thing that he really emphasized, let me see. Uh, if we go here on the right-hand side, uh, he's talking about the men and their crew, and he says, they have great confidence in our man courier and are determined to stick by us. And it just, you know, reconfirms my belief that courier was a consummate leader, a natural. You know, I don't think he had to dictate and you know, browbeat people. I think he was just one of those people that, you know, men wanted to follow and, and he was a natural born leader. I think we're almost done. Oh, that this one was just labeled three tenths in the on the upper North Fork, which is right near where they uh, where they eventually ended up mining. That bear is dead, so don't worry about it. <laughs> um, that fit photo we've already seen earlier. Uh, here's a picture of Fred on the right uh, down in California, and the second man over, Daniel Jepson, is the son, no, the grandson of Ed Conrad, a courier's right-hand man on, the, on these trips. 
Um, another uh, repeat of the picture that you've seen earlier, I only pointed out because uh, here on the, the left, they refer to it as Wolverine Gulch, which if you look on maps of today, um, there is a tributary of Damar Creek that's called Wolverine Creek. So it just further confirms we're in the right spot. And then over here on the right, it says where a good prospect was found. So, you know, this was the place where they probably ended up producing most of their gold. How much? The answer to that is the same that the spirit gave me earlier. You don't ask a miner how much gold he found in the summer. He's not going to tell you, and he's going to remember it and resent you for asking. There's the end of the, the photographs. Um, so I started this out by saying, how do we know all of these facts and things about Fred Courier? So one of the ways we know is all those terrific photographs. Um, I mentioned that uh, the, the background on the, the, the book, he wrote the manuscript in 1934, but died and it was found uh, 50 years later by his daughter. Um, a friend of mine, it ended up in his office at the University of Alaska, and I was helping him when he retired. I was helping him clean out his office, and you all know how that goes. You throw this in that pile, and you throw this in that pile, and he had this box, and he just handed it to me. I said, what's this? He said, it's a book manuscript. You'll like it. Well, when I got home that night, I mean, it was just blew me away how good it is. Um, I can't tell you I've read every history book, uh, Alaska history book, but I've read most of them. And this is honest to God on par in terms of uh, content, you know, factual content, but also just the quality of the writing. So we also have another special guest with us tonight, uh, Leslie. Johnson from uh, over across the river in um, uh, Afton. Uh, we met uh, when she discovered my book and I just asked her if she would be willing to write, uh, to read a, a passage from it to, to share with you folks. Oh, that's right. You have to come up, you have to stand in the box. Hi, can you all hear me? Um, uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm just thrilled to be here. I actually um, crossed paths with Randy and reached out to him. Uh, Frederick Courier was a um, journalist and editor for the River Falls uh, Journal, and he actually wrote about a minor, uh, a woman minor who, from Ireland who I was researching. Um, and so um, I started doing a little research on um, Frederick, and then um, that's how I uh, got connected with Randy. and. Uh, um, so the, the, the book, I concur with, um, Randy, everything, it's, it's quite amazing and it's extremely well written. Um, Randy asked if I would share one of my favorite passages of the book and I actually had a really hard time. I've got, I started dog hearing like almost every other page and then I thought, no, this is a good one. This is a good one. And I thought I just need to nod and then kind of wait and see which, um, which, um, what stories kind of stuck with me? And, and that's the one I'm going to read tonight here. Um, so the miners had uh, their own uh, mining laws up there, you know, the lawless area at the time. But they, they created their own. And uh, it mimicked our, uh, our own judicial system with a few interesting twists and turns. Um, so I'll, I'll start. They, uh, they rounded everyone up in this um, mining area. Um, there had been a violation of a long-standing law. Somebody had broken into a cache, which is kind of considered sacrosanct. You simply don't do, you don't go into another man's cache and take anything there. And somebody had done that. Yeah, and this was, um, it was a Alaska Native American and um, that, the, that the cache belonged to a, a tribe and um, they were not happy. So we rounded all the, all the people up in the saloon. Um, and I'll read a little bit about um, uh, what took place here. Men, shouted friend, friend being one of the men. Here's Alexander from the Birch Creek camp. He was there the chief. And he claims that his cash up on the seven mile has been robbed. What are you going to do about it? Let's hear Alexander's story, shouted back someone. Wait a moment, said Lansing. We better do this in order. 
I move that Buckskin <clears throat> Miller act as chairman of this meeting. Second the motion, a voice call. The motion was put and carried, and Buckskin Miller was escorted to the table near which a chair was placed for him. Now, gentlemen, let us have a clerk, he announced. Handshaker Bob was chosen, and you'll know they all have nicknames, by the way. <laughs> we are ready now to proceed in an orderly manner, said Miller. Alexander, come up here and tell your story. The Birch Creek chief and half a dozen hunters had been standing quietly on one side during the preliminaries. None up to this time had spoken a word. But the old chief at Miller's invitation came forward and in broken English said, Birch Creek Indians have cash on 70 mile. Catch them, all cash 70 mile. We go kill a moose, kill a bear, crooked creek. Snow come, cold, freeze. Indians come back 70 mile to get fish, get robes, get snowshoes, get sleds, 70 mile cache broken open, fish gone, skins gone, snowshoes gone, white man take them. Birch Creek Indians very angry. Young men say, go kill white men. Alexander Moore wise, he come tell white man. White man pay Indians, kill thief, all good friends then. Not a word had been spoken by anyone else while the old chief was uttering his broken, laconic sentences. Alexander, how do you know it was a white man who robbed your catch? Questioned the judge. Did you see him? Perhaps it was a wolverine or a pack of wolves that broke in. No wolves. No Wolverine, replied Alexander, shaking hard his head. White man, me no see him. See tracks under cash. White man tracks, white man boots. Three white men, holding up three fingers. Tracks show now all hard, freeze them in mud. It's a clear case, boys said Miller, turning to his audience. The Indians don't make mistakes about such signs. We must hunt out the thieves, the thief or thieves, and punish them. Now, to sift this thing down to where we can do something, let me ask, who came down past 70 Mile this last fall? I did, answered Missouri Bill. Came down in September from 40 Mile. Saw the cash at 70 mile, but didn't stop. Don't know if it had been touched or not. A score of others, including ourselves, gave similar testimony. In fact, nearly half the camp had come down that fall when the news of the new diggings at Circle had reached 40 mile. Among the few who had camped at 70 mile on their way down, no one had noticed anything wrong with the Indians' cash. <clears throat> well, let's get at it another way, said Miller. I will ask, who was the last man into camp before it froze up? Now, I won't spoil the story, but it goes on like this. And they very um, creatively and um, shrewdly come to the truth. And it was taken care of. Um, so I, I, I just, like I said, I wanted to mention the story because I think it talks to how they handle disputes and also how much they value the relationships with the indigenous people there. Um, I also want to end by saying that um, I think it's wonderful we're hosting this here in River Falls, uh, where Frederick Currier was born in 1860. And Frederick also, um, after his um, time in Alaska, came down and gave um, uh, presentations himself about his travels up in, up in Alaska. So thank you. Thanks, Leslie. Um, so just a, a little quick wrap, wrap up. Um, so we had this manuscript and uh, you know it was so good I wanted to share it, but you don't just run off and publish somebody else's manuscript. And so um, you, you, know, you need permission from the family in some manner. 
It took a year and a half, but I finally eventually tracked down Frederick's grandson, who lives in California. And um, they, as I mentioned, I think mentioned before, they had been trying to get it published for quite a while. And once I clearly explained what I was trying to do, they immediately said, yes, please, you know, proceed. And so, um, you know, he came up to Fairbanks for the book release and, and it was uh, really great. Uh, he told me in advance, I'm gonna bring a bunch of other stuff with me related to the book. At the time I was so busy, it just kind of went right on by, but it was things like the, uh, some of the photographs we showed with you and the original, we have the original handwritten manuscript and you know things like that, which are just so valuable. Um, and then after the book was published, uh, other people, uh, including Ed Conrad's great grandson, got a copy. And after he read it, he contacted me and he had a bunch of other photographs, as I mentioned. So um, when Leslie originally contacted me, she brought up the idea, you know, do you ever come back to Wisconsin in the summer? Sure, I do. And so we, uh, she came up with the idea of this presentation here tonight. And uh, it's good to know that uh, some of you folks are, are interested in this sort of thing. One of the phrases that I use in regards to this book and this whole overall project, I refer to it as a gift that keeps on giving, because as I've mentioned to you, you know, we had the, a typed version of it, but then we got the handwritten version, and then we got the photographs, and then we got this, and then we got this, and it seems like every couple of years something else will kind of come out of nowhere that adds to the story. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask tonight is, are there any, is there anybody here tonight that is a part of the Courier uh, family in any way, or do you know of anybody that, that is a descendant of the Courier family? Because we know that they were still here, you know, years after he left. Well, that's what I was afraid of. Now back to the book. Um, as I mentioned, I had expected to have copies of the book here tonight but that did not work out. So we have a sheet over there. If you'd like, put your name and, and email address down. And when I get back up to Fairbanks, I will contact you. If you want to take your own initiative, you can go to the, the book was published by the Alaska Trappers Association. So our website is www.alaskatrappers.org and you can order it yourself. So uh, if you'd like to get a copy and, uh, you know, either one way or the other, uh, I encourage you to, to follow through. So I guess I'll stop there and ask if there are any comments, questions, anything of that nature. Yes, ma'am. So you mentioned second wife in California. What happened to his River Falls family? His, his River Falls wife passed away. Now, I don't remember any details about that. I think that there are details available. I just don't remember what they are. And did his children from River Falls then end up in California? I believe the answer is yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. He had he had a number of um, siblings who, in fact, his mother was buried in River Falls. I think it's in Greenwood, and he had a number of siblings and cousins. He, one of his first cousins was married to a Powell, Oliver Powell's daughter, Lucy. Um, and uh, yeah, they they have a, a really long and actually, I, I believe, continued history in this area. Well, none of none of those descendants are. I don't. I you know. I'm not certain. I'm, I'm yeah. Make sure you talk well enough that people that oh yeah I'm sure plus it's a recorded history in the making here so if you have something to share say it loud. So what was your observation? <laughs> the, the, the couriers I mean they were here a lot in the early years but the descendants are no longer in this area. The last descendants would have been of this uncle Daniel Courier who was actually a miner during the 49 gold rush. His, his descendants, Albert Courier, and then the Allen family, they would have been here maybe 50 years ago, but not nobody recently. I see. Okay. And you had? Yeah. <clears throat> he spent 10 years in Alaska, but he had a family here in River Falls. What happened to his family during those 10 years? You know, that's something that, you know, the, the spirit told us earlier that he was on a train from Wisconsin out to Oregon to buy an apple orchard. And he ran into these two guys that had been up in Alaska looking for gold and they were going back. And you can imagine the conversation, you know, why don't you come with us? Yeah, okay. 
Well, in today's world, I mean, that just wouldn't happen. But, you know, back at that time, you know, you hear about men riding the rails and looking for work and trying to, you know, find something. And so, I mean, I understand your question, and I think we all kind of would have the same one, but it wasn't, he wasn't the only one that made snap decisions like that. I, we assume that he probably sent a letter or a telegram or something like that from Seattle or Vancouver or whatever saying, hey, I won't be back for a while, but... You know, that was could have been the extent of it. Yes, Leslie. And I was going to say, did he come back to between his two and build a house with his first um, earnings in, um, in River Falls? That when he, then after he, to get uh, between his two trips to Alaska, and then when he got the group together to go back up the second time, I think he, yeah, so he wasn't up there like the whole 10, 10, 10 years, I guess. Right. Yeah, uh, it was two, like four or five year breaks. But the question never less remains, how do you just go off on a lark like that? But I, I, I don't think that was all that unique. Do you know how his family survived? Well, I think they had a farm here. And so, you know, with a few chickens and a few cows and a few pigs and crops. I know this is his daughter, uh, Geneva, was born in South Dakota in 1893. I think they came back from South Dakota to River Falls. He was he was an editor here in the, uh, when they came back from the first time, um, and the family lived here. And then when he came back from Alaska the first time, they built a house at River Falls. Um, and then that's when he, and he was an editor for the journal. Um, and I, I, I would editor Calvin Morris. That? You're saying he worked under Calvin Morris? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, he was in the editor. He might have been yeah, in, the, in the term of years. Yeah, in between his two trips. But I wonder, do you think he would have brought, he probably sent money home, or if he was able to, if he was able to exchange, you know, if he was able to do that at any point? That would have been really hard for him to send money home because, um, you know, like those two years they were on the Upper China, there was just no way of, communicating with the outside world. And even in better situations, like when you were in major communities like Circle City or, or, or uh, others, um, you know, it was just widely accepted by everybody that you would send a letter out on the outgoing Sternwheeler and you might get one the next summer when the Sternwheeler came back. So communication was oftentimes, you know, many months, even a year between when you sent something and received something. So sending money, I think, maybe, it, maybe, but it would have been difficult. Or, or maybe when a friend went out, you know, he quit the mining operation and left, maybe that somebody like that could bring money, money back. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Maybe you know this more than he does, but do you know where the house is that they built supposedly? No, I think it's in the book, I think it's as the general area in this book. I recall that. Yeah. So we could probably like find it. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I can't tell you the answer to that, but I can tell you that um, one of the things I've felt, believed since the very beginning is that with all of the material that we have, especially the writings, I have always felt that there is enough material there for an upper level undergrad or even a master's student to do a project, to compare his handwriting style and, you know, how he modified things to come up with his books and all that. And I finally have found somebody that's willing to pursue that and they would investigate the sorts of things you're talking about, you know, come back and, and try to learn more of the details uh, from here in River Falls, but also from then his time in California. So not don't have an answer, but there may be you know more information forthcoming as that person digs in. Sounds like you've got some of those answers. Maybe you'll be a good source of information. Well, I don't have that one particular answer. Yeah. I don't know what they want to hear here, so. There's a section where it says a year at home in River Falls in 1897. Yeah. 
Well, okay. Thank you very much uh, for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you decide to get a copy of the book. Uh, I can guarantee that you're going to enjoy it. And I want to thank Nathan Ireland. I want to thank Leslie for, for helping out here. Us. There's obviously, uh, there's the Pierce County Historical Society is, did I get that right? Association. Yes. Association is, is here. So there's some, awesome. some very interesting minds. In the All audience. right. Well, that's good to okay. know. Um, I want to thank Nathan Ireland. Would you get, stand up here for a minute? <laughs> lives and works in River Falls. He has three children that are all currently high schoolers, and he's been acting with River Falls Community Theater since 2018, and we were all extremely relieved to find somebody who was willing to learn the part and play the part, because not all librarians are really, you know, that great of actors, so we were, we were, pretty, we were like, oh boy, who are we going to find to do this? Um, and I, I do, in, in addition to thanking all of you for being here and, and for Randy and Leslie and, and Nathan, I want to mention that um, coming up on Wednesday, October 9th, we have um, a local, well, he's, he's a cellist. He's a performance uh, performer for the cello. His name is Alex Chamber Ozaski, and he's got a bunch of degrees after his name, and I think his family is local. Anyway, he's been here before, and he was a huge hit. Lots and lots of people show up. We had him in the meeting room upstairs. This time we're going to put him uh, in the main area of the library where those windows are. We've been lately having some music performances there. So if you have time to stop over on Wednesday, August 9th at around 6 p.m., you'll have a chance to hear his music. And uh, that's it. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you.